Hello, dear friends. Thank you for being so patient. I know you you are very tired already. So I'll try to be very short. I'm Yelena Milov, and I represent here a non-profit organization, Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, and our crowdfunding platform, Lifespine.io, the only crowdfunding platform which aims to exclusively support research on aging and longevity. We have existed for one and a half years, and since the foundation, we managed to collect more than $200,000 to help launch four promising studies in the field of aging research. I would like to tell you today about them and also to share our experience uh, of, about how to communicate the most productive way with the general public. Well, here are our funders. Keith Kameda, our president, is actually my author. And here are great people who help us very much to stay on the right path in the field of aging research. So, we have enjoyed hosting two campaigns for the Sense Research Foundation. The first was MitoSense, which, uh, where the research team successfully moved two mitochondrial genes from mitochondria to the nucleus, where these genes are more protected against the uh, oxidative stress. And as you know, mitochondria are our power plants of our cells, and if we keep them more healthy, then we keep the cells more healthy and more functional for longer. The second project, uh, the second project was OncoSense, and I would like to underline the high social significance of this project because this is a screening of uh, drug delivery in order to find a cure against a very specific type of cancer, which makes uh, from 10 to 15 percent of all cases of cancer. This is a cancer involving ALT mechanism, which stands for alternative lengthening of telomeres. Hopefully, we will see the results in the coming years. And the other two studies are Major Mouse Testing Program and Cell Age. Both studies are aimed at testing and developing methods to control the numbers of senescent cells in our bodies, the old cells that are uh, spoiling the environment. Uh, this is a very hot topic right now, and also we hope to see the results in the coming years. We are very proud that we actually provide support exactly with it where it's needed the most. Uh, which, uh, which, is, uh, which means that we still need uh, a lot of data in order to proceed to the stage of clinical trials, which uh, means to develop the uh, treatments for humans. However, the uh, state funding is most often allocated to the mainstream areas, such as research on single diseases, for instance, and business for its part doesn't really show much support, much interest in uh, fundamental science because usually there is no final product that could be sold. The, uh, the only source that remains, the source of funding that remains, is actually the general public. But the problem with the general public is that it is not sufficiently informed about the plausibility of bringing aging under reasonable medical control, which means that we have a lot of educational work to do uh, if we want to increase public support for this type of research. And to be frank, actually it's the case that many activists are uh, unintentionally work against this very important goal. Uh, how exactly? Well, by ignoring several most important educational principles, also known as didactic principles. And breaking these simple principles makes it much harder for people to learn, and sometimes it's even pushing away uh, the potential supporters. So, um, let's become better at teaching, because it's very important for all of us. I'm going to briefly uh, tell you uh, about these principles that we should not break. First, this is a principle of a conscious and active learning, which means that the person we are dealing with should be interested in learning, should be interested to acquire more information about uh, aging and potential of uh, geoprotective technologies to extend healthy life. But uh, in order to make people interested, we should understand them, understand what exactly they want. Do you really think that they want something like life extension? Uh, actually not. The studies show that when we use this specific expression, life extension, most of people think that we're going to extend the old age, the period of frailty, the period of disease. Uh, and uh, what about the word immortality, which is also used pretty frequently by uh, longevity advocates? Well, once again, 
uh, the public perception is working against us. There was a very interesting study of um, how pop culture is picturing uh, immortal people. And uh, actually, in most cases, they are pictured as dangerous, morally inferior, suffering from different sins and prone to some sort of tedium. So when people, people from the general audience hear this word, immortality, normally they start thinking, oh, would I really like to be like this? Would I really like to become some sort of mad, criminal, immortal? So, uh, as you can guess, these people probably will not want to acquire more information about how to deal with aging, because they just don't see any positive things in it. But, uh, well, what we, can, uh, what we can offer to people instead of these dangerous expressions? Uh, studies show that if the possibility of perfect health throughout life is introduced into the equation from the very beginning, people show much more uh, support to the idea of, ex of a prolonging life. And people li literally flow from one camp to another. These who expected, uh, who, who wanted to live up to, say, 80 years, start to wanting to live longer to 100, People who were okay with living to maximum lifespan, which is 120 years, start thinking about living longer and even indefinitely. So this little factor, which means healthy life extension, can change perception pretty much. Another important point uh, in the beginning of the conversation is the emphasis on the fact that innovative technologies are meant to treat or prevent severe diseases such as cancer, Alzheimer's, or stroke, or diabetes, or heart disease. People are ready to support the development of new medical technologies, even scary ones like gene therapies, for instance, if they are going to be used to cure severe diseases. We cannot say the same thing uh, in case we are speaking about life extension, because people perceive life extension as, as some sort of enhancement, and this sort of uh, um, enhancement is not supported and often is rejected. So now I hope we agree that uh, the more productive way to begin the conversation is to explain that these new technologies to address aging are aimed at prolonging the period of health and use, and they are also going to help us treat and prevent severe diseases, severe chronic diseases like the age-related ones. This will create a positive motivation to continue learning and this way the public will be much more supportive. Now let's talk about another didactic principle uh, which is the uh, principle of systematization. Uh, systematization means that the information you are providing to people should be divided into small units, and these units should be arranged into an educational logic to ensure that people acquire uh, information on a systemic basis. I'd like to remind you that most people, unlike us, know almost nothing about aging. They know almost nothing about the mechanisms of aging. They do not understand the causal relationship between the mechanisms of aging, damage accumulation, and the onset of age-related diseases. So most people just do not believe that by addressing aging we can get some health benefits. So in, if we really want them to learn, we should be much more systematic. And another principle is the principle of accessibility and individual approach. Uh, it also should be taken into account because this principle means that you should speak with people in a language that they will be able to understand. I, uh, I know pretty well that most of us would try to be accurate in a scientific way. We try to use the accurate scientific terms, but terms actually do not matter in case you are not understood at all. So it's better to reduce the level of the language you are using in order to be uh, understood much better. Um, another, way, another way to see this problem is that actually when people hear a lot of words that they do not understand, it, the, the discussion becomes boring for them. And boredom is another obstacle we have to overcome if we want them to learn. Now, uh, this principle also requires an individual approach. 
every person actually comes to the movement, comes to these ideas with their own background, with their own fears, with their special needs. And we should respect that. Before someone can really become a supporter of the movement for healthy longevity, they need to get rid of their concerns related to the extended lifespans. However, studies show that the gerontologists themselves are not always ready to deal with this matter. And this is understandable because they are normally specialists in their specific field, and they may not have sufficient <coughs> knowledge to answer questions from other areas. But it's worse, really worse, worse for the advocates of healthy longevity like you and me to take time to learn about these additional subjects in order to be uh, able to answer questions in an appropriate way. Now, <coughs> uh, let's say we have successfully, uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to say, to say if you want to read the studies that uh, provided a lot of information for this, for this presentation, uh, there will be a list of studies in my presentation and you're welcome to uh, come to me in a break and ask uh, me to send it to you. So, um, let's say we successfully ever came uh, these initial problems related to <coughs> didactic principles. But this doesn't mean that uh, all the difficulties are, are over, because now we are going through a minefield of cognitive biases. So, where to begin with? There are several that I like the most, I will talk about them very shortly. Uh, we at LEAF have discovered that, that actually the, call, the group calls in social media that do not work very well, uh, in terms of raising funds. So groups, polls, do not work. When we address people personally, however, they respond readily and provide support. The same thing actually happens in the experiments of the psychologists with people outside the digital world. So if there are many witnesses of an accident, uh, there is a high chance that none of them will react. But if there is only one person nearby, most possibly he will react. So, uh, this bias is called a diffusion of responsibility, and we shall take it into account when we are dealing with uh, the general public and especially with the newcomers to the community. Another bias closely related to this one is the identifiable victim effect. This effect means that people are more keen to help one particular person who for some reason is suffering that, rather than a group of people suffering from the same thing. Well, as you can guess, everyone in this room is suffering from aging, and in this world as well. And uh, you can probably find a group which will be more uh, indeterminate. So, uh, the solution here is always to ask for whose sake the person is ready to provide support for the scientific research on aging. What is this one special person suffering today or under threat of getting some well, age-related diseases tomorrow? Well, probably it's myself or myself. Probably it's someone else. But uh, still, this simple question can remove this bias uh, from your path. The third bias I would like to mention is called neglect. Um, we are not meant to assess the severity of the problem. Uh, that's what it's all about. So, for instance, uh, often when we are dealing with the general public, they ask us why we are not spending our efforts to deal with the problem of hunger in the world. Okay, uh, let's take a look at numbers. Um, every minute about six people die of starvation, but there are 70 dying from aging or age-related diseases. Uh, if we are asked about the problems with the air transport, we can actually remind people that during all the history of air transport, uh, only 150,000 people have died in different plane accidents. This is exactly the amount of people who die every single day from the diseases of aging. Oops. So, uh, as you see, biases can be also a very big obstacle on our road, on our path. So, uh, our goal here is to get more familiar with all these things, just to browse a list of different biases in order to be ready for them, because we humans are not meant to be completely rational, and sometimes we are going to really need to understand the background, what lies behind this or that decision, this or that reaction people provide. So, advocacy, as you see, is a complicated story. 
it's good that we uh, already have all this data and uh, that we still can achieve a lot uh, despite all these obstacles. My task today is not to frighten you with the complexities of the advocates' work, but rather to arm you with the knowledge to increase your chances of convincing the audience that aging research is really important and deserves uh, their support. The more effectively we can communicate, the sooner we can bring aging under reasonable medical control. So, uh, what will be our takeaway points here? Well, first of all, let's talk about the extension of the healthy periods of life more often, especially with new people. Let's explain to people that the technologies to address aging mechanisms are going to help us treat and prevent age-related diseases. Let's try to be more systematic, start with the basics. Uh, and let's take into account that we humans are a little bit biased sometimes. So in short, let's try to use the right words in the right order and to deliver the right message. Thank you.